Okay, so today we're just going to do a bit of a dive into the way COVID has affected um, psychiatric disorders, substance use disorders, and overall behavioral health. Um, I'm going to try to give a decent overview of where we have been and where we're going. Uh, as if you guys haven't heard enough on this topic over the past year and a half um, and ongoing. Uh, as a reminder, if anyone has any trouble getting connected or hearing, please just stop us, let us know. Um, and since we have such a small group, if people have questions, just go ahead and jump in. Um, as far as our CME information goes, uh, we sent this out with the flyer today. Uh, there is a number to be texted. Um, if you've already set up your account at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, that information has been sent as well in the meeting invitation. And there is an event ID that you need to include in the body of the text to get your CME credits. We have no new conflicts of interest to disclose. Today, um, we're just going to go through a brief didactic presentation on the topic that, that we have today. We're going to do a brief case discussion, and then we're going to review our upcoming lectures. So our goals are really just to review the emerging trends in psychiatric epidemiology, both during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we hope that you'll better understand this from the scientific perspective um, as far as what the data tells us is really going on in the world and what we can expect in the coming months and years. And we hope that you'll be able to differentiate populations who are at risk for different pandemic related psychological impacts. We know this is impacting just about everyone in the world, but I hope that uh, listeners will be able to come away knowing who they see in the clinic might be at increased risk. So we, like I said, we all know that the pandemic has hit us hard, but the data really, really back that up in a way that I think tells us that this is increasing rates of psychiatric problems to a rate that we haven't seen before um, in other societal changes or uh, big events that have impacted uh, different, different cultures, different nations. This is, this is a worldwide event that has really caused a severe problem um, in behavioral health. Studies are reporting that about 40% of people uh, during the acute stage of the pandemic were experiencing uh, acute psychiatric disorders, mostly affective disorders. So these are things like anxiety disorders, major depressive disorders, stress-related conditions. Um, and like we talked about last week, at least about one in 10 people have reported serious suicidal ideation during the pandemic, which is a really, really shocking number. So this shows the broad scope of psychiatric issues uh, that are being experienced by quite a lot of people. It's also probably unsurprising for many of you that we're seeing increases in, in alcohol, tobacco, illicit drug use. And most of this we can expect is tied to boredom with people being locked up at home a lot, stress, of course, and then lack of social connections, loss of daily structure. People are sort of struggling to find meaning or excitement in their day-to-day -day life. And so we're seeing a lot of people who did not use substances problematically before the pandemic, maybe start to drink more than they used to or use things like cannabis more than they used to, smoke more, more cigarettes than they used to. And we're also seeing people that were previously experiencing substance use problems uh, used to an even greater level during the pandemic. Now, where we are in the pandemic has sort of influenced the sort of the psychological problems that we're seeing predominantly at that time. Now, early in the pandemic, we're all just reeling from this and, and sort of wondering, what does this mean? How long is this going to last? Or what do you mean I have to stay at home um, for, for weeks and weeks at a time? It, nobody knew that this was going to be a year or more. 
Um, so it's unsurprising that we saw a really big spike in anxiety disorders at the beginning. We saw a big increase in domestic violence as people were sort of cooped up and stressed at home and uncertain of what the future would hold for them. We also saw that the pandemic caused a, um, a large decrement in physical health. We saw people uh, resorting to poor uh, physical health habits, getting bad sleep. They were spending a lot of time online, um, which is, I think, what people tend to spend their time doing when they're cooped up at home. And this, of course, feeds back into having poor physical health, experiencing greater anxiety and uncertainty about the future. Now, as we've progressed during the pandemic, things have changed a little bit. Now, we're not all super anxious anymore about what's the future going to hold for us. We, we've sort of gotten used to this and realized that it's all going to be OK, but it's caused a lot of ongoing disruption in our lives. And what we've seen is this transition away from anxiety disorders being the predominant issue to more of an increase in depression, hopelessness and stress related problems. We're in fact seeing that the fourth wave um, can be contributing to sort of a, a, a long term slow burn increase in depression and in fact suicidal ideation. There is ongoing research in the area of suicide uh, suggesting that when traumatic global events such as this happen that we don't always see people report huge increases in suicidality in the immediate first wave of this. It's more so the case that as the stress of this event takes its toll over months and years that we start to see really long term and consistently elevated uh, increases in depression and suicidality. And finally, as we try to start getting over this pandemic, we're seeing the emergence of post-traumatic stress, particularly in people who've lost loved ones, people who've underwent radical life changes, or people who've in fact suffered from infection, COVID-19, were hospitalized, put on a ventilator, things of that sort. And that's a, that's a topic that I think will become even more important in the months to years um, as we go forward. It's, it's what COVID post-traumatic stress looks like. Now, there's been a good amount of research that suggests that a lot of people have been affected by this diverse backgrounds. There's almost nobody that COVID-19 doesn't touch. But we do have a better idea as this is played out who has suffered the brunt of the impact. And we've identified various risk factors that, that tell us who is probably suffering the worst and who in the clinic should we be keeping an eye on um, for negative COVID-19 reactions. So people who are suffering like negative changes in their physical activity, they're getting poor sleep, they're using more substances. Obviously, that's a risk factor for negative psychological reactions. People are using a lot of internet. That's, of course, a um, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly a negative risk factor. We find that those folks are, are experiencing increased anxiety um, and probably learning a lot of information that may be troubling to them. Um, they also report increased loneliness. So increased internet use, probably not the best thing, especially as we move forward. We really need to be encouraging people to get out there, get off the internet, stop watching movies and re-engage in their life. And perhaps unsurprisingly, people report that previous psychiatric diagnosis prior to COVID-19 is a negative prognostic indicator. However, I would say that's a little bit controversial. There is alternative research to suggest that while people who had a diagnosis beforehand are at risk, 
we're seeing a lot more people who had no psychiatric diagnoses recorded beforehand who are suddenly experiencing very, very severe problems. And that on the other hand, the people who came in with a pre-COVID diagnosis may actually regress towards the mean a little bit. That, yeah, they're at risk for negative uh, reactions, but overall, they, the, the scores tend to balance out over time. So that's a controversial uh, sort of area. Demographically, we're seeing that females tend to be reporting stronger uh, negative reactions than males. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the COVID pandemic has impacted those of lower socioeconomic status, minority ethnic groups to a greater degree. Um, one finding that stuck out to me was that people of younger age tended to be reporting more psychosocial problems uh, during the pandemic than people with older age. Um, we know that people in the older age groups have probably been more isolated during the pandemic due to greater risk of infection, um, but it seems that there may be resilience factors where older um, individuals are not coming down with as great of a psychosocial burden. Um, and those with chronic illnesses, of course, I think are experiencing disruptions in their medical care. They're having trouble being able to rehabilitate um, and they're suffering a greater impact. Now, occupationally, we've heard probably a lot about frontline workers, particularly medical workers, being hit hard in this. So I think as people see patients, when they're seeing nurses, when they're seeing other caregivers, particularly caregivers of disabled adults, um, those can be risk factors for a significant burden um, imposed during this time period and should sort of raise those alarm bells in your head as a clinician that it would be helpful to pay a little bit more attention to how this person is adjusting. Now, a little bit on substance use, which I think is a really, really interesting topic during the pandemic. Um, so we can expect, and, and there is good research to support, that people are using more substances. But there's, there are actually some interesting trends to what substances are being used more often. Now, because of travel restrictions and lockdowns, in different states, municipalities, and national borders, this has caused actually supply chain disruption in a lot of illicit substances. So for instance, in Texas, a lot of our marijuana or cocaine or heroin comes across the Mexican border. And with disruptions in supply chains and normal movements of persons in which those substances get transported, that's gonna cause disruptions in what's available and that's going to change what people are using and abusing. So because there's been a limited supply of some substances, we see often that people who have substance use problems are switching to more adulterated, cheap substances, things that are made um, cheaply by amateurs who may not always get it right, and things that are, of course, very, very cheap and can be easily altered to get a euphoric effect. This has mainly affected the market of methamphetamine and heroin. As heroin has become harder to come by, we see a lot of opioid-related substances that may not be safe, may be adulterated, and can be very dangerous. And this has very much impacted the methamphetamine trade, um, where we're seeing a lot more cases of people sort of cooking methamphetamine rather than relying on the traditional supply chains, the true supply chains that were mostly Mexican cartels. We've also seen a huge increase in the black market for prescription drugs that are getting diverted. So I think prescribers need to be very, very aware uh, that the prices of prescription drugs have gone up significantly during the pandemic. And so people that may have not been as inclined to divert their medication may feel a slight um, more inclination uh, to divert these things. And we're seeing a huge increase in the use of fentanyl, other synthetic opioids and prescription opioids, which has been the case for quite a few years now. It's just that the COVID-19 pandemic has really made this a whole lot worse.
Hey, David, I don't mean to interrupt you, but did you see the sure. new numbers? The new numbers the CDC released yesterday that 93,000 people died in the last year of drug overdoses. And that, I, I seen that. yeah, that's a 30% increase in one year. And what's gone completely unnoticed is that Texas has went up 34%, which is like unbelievable wow. uh, bump in Texas. We've always had very low especially opiate overdoses. So as they dig into those data, I'm afraid everything you're saying is going to have even more sad meaning. Yeah, that is, uh, I'm really glad you shared that information. That That's really alarming about the increase in Texas. I think it's going to be really interesting, um, but probably very disheartening how this plays out as the data come in um, more and more. Um, so, one uh, one thing I want to mention is the drugs that we're seeing the largest increases in use in are alcohol, cannabis, and benzodiazepines. Now, alcohol and cannabis, this may not be surprising because they're the most widely used illegal, um, well, not necessarily illegal, but they're the most widely used drugs. So alcohol is legal, available, it makes sense that people are going to turn to it in large numbers. Cannabis is extremely widely used, which probably makes it unsurprising that people have been using more of this, especially when under conditions of isolation. Um, it was a little bit surprising to me to see benzodiazepine use being so high, but maybe it's unsurprising given the, the incredible amount of stress that people have been undertaking, um, which may create be creating a market for these. And it's maybe because they're also available that there's a prescription market that people have been able to tap into and that these are making their way out on the streets and into users' hands as an alternative, maybe to other drugs that they had been using, that maybe they're saying, okay, I'm, I'm open to trying these. Um, I'll briefly just touch on overdoses and hospitalizations. We have undoubtedly seen an increase, a, a very large increase, increase in opioid overdoses. There are a lot of studies that are reporting uh, more EMS runs, more Narcan being distributed than ever before. Um, emergency departments are seeing increases in all types of drug overdoses, but opioids are, are really uh, a large percentage of these. And in the ED departments, we're also seeing a large increase in suicide attempts. I should mention as well, we are seeing a lot of domestic violence making its way into ED departments, child abuse, but the drug overdoses and suicide attempts are making up the, uh, uh, the large portion of those. So let's touch on where we're going. As the vaccines roll out, as quarantines and other uh, other legal controls start to go away and we're seeing people get out there and get back to what resembles a normal life. I think what we can expect is that the burden of affective disorders is going to continue for quite a long period of time. I think we should expect that anxiety disorders, major depression, and post-traumatic stress are going to be with us for a very, very long time. And it'll be interesting to see how the rates of these conditions play out over the next six to 12 months. We can expect that the elevation in drug overdoses is probably going to continue because of these stress-related disorders, these affective problems, and the enduring social and financial instability uh, that has occurred. As I mentioned earlier, suicide rates tend to become elevated at a later period during a disaster or very socially disruptive event. So I think we could expect to see that the suicide rate may even climb. Um, so that's something to really, really watch out for right now. And as people get back to what resembles a normal routine, I think we should expect to see more people reporting things like social anxiety and agoraphobia um, or just trouble getting back to social situations. So we need to be understanding that people are going to have trouble 
um, and that there may be an adjustment period where we all sort of relearn what it's like to get along in groups and to deal with social stress and a lot of relationships with colleagues, with friends, with all sorts of different people. And I think we should be mindful of the ongoing financial impacts that are going to be affecting that are going to be affecting a lot of people, particularly those um, uh, those most um, most at risk of suffering during these times, and that financial instability factors in um, to a lot of psychiatric and substance abuse issues. So those less fortunate, we should be particularly mindful. Um, now, there's also some very interesting research that I want to discuss very briefly about the, the notion of post-COVID-19 um, psychiatric effects. So research has suggested that in the aftermath of having COVID-19, people who have been infected are experiencing psychiatric impacts. I don't want to delve too deep into the neuroscience and the pathophysiology of why that might be happening, um, but we are seeing that people who have been infected with COVID-19 are showing consistently elevated in increases in affective disorders in the six months post-infection. We're also seeing some evidence that these individuals are at risk for neurocognitive impairments, it's just problems with attention, processing speed, um, making decisions in their everyday life. We've also mentioned the notion of post-traumatic stress. Uh, there's a lot of research suggesting that people who have uh, were hospitalized and who experience severe infection are at high risk for post-traumatic stress disorder. And finally, people who are coming off infection, I think, uh, can face uh, significant uh, troubles retaining the quality of life uh, in the aftermath of this infection. And there's growing evidence that some folks who have had COVID-19 are experiencing this phenomenon called long COVID, where their symptoms just tend to last and last and last. So even though they feel mostly healthy, they're still coughing, they're still fatigued, they're still having trouble sleeping. Um, so that could take quite a toll.